did the Republican Party evolve from the man who freed the slaves to the man who would eventually sympathize with white supremacists? And how exactly did the Demo Democratic Party shift from the harsh relocation of Native Americans to the party that would eventually elect the first black president? In today's political climate, Republicans and Democrats are two polar opposites. They bicker, they disagree, they argue about the correct quote-unquote direction of the country. These opposing views have changed, altered, and moved in different directions over the course of America's history. In this presentation, I will explain how the Democrats and Republicans have switched from their respective founding ideologies. Now, let's start with the Democrats. The, Democrat, the Democratic Party was founded in 1828 and is actually the world's oldest active political party. Key founders included, but not limited to, Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. The Democratic Party was founded on the ideas put forth by the former Democratic Republican Party. This party was founded by some key founding fathers, including Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. The ideas and ideologies of the Democratic Republicans focused on states' rights and a very limited, small federal government. These ideas were deeply resonant with farmers and other agricultural workers of the time period. Now, on the opposing side of this, we have the Republican Party. The Republican Party was founded in 1854, a little bit time after the Democratic Party, and it was founded in direct opposition to slavery. Key founders included Abraham Lincoln, Francis Preston Blair, and Horace Greeley. While the main founding reason was the opposition to the expansion of slavery, Many Republican policies are traced back to the former Whig Party. The Whig Party was historically led by Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and William Henry Harrison. Now, the Whig Party was a complete polar opposite of the Democratic Party. They focused on a power federal government, uh, a national bank, and an economic plan called the American System put forth by Henry Clay. Here is a video on that. All your business needs, one single platform. Go to Wix.com and get a robust booking solution. Today in the Daily Dose, the rise and fall of the Whig Party. Once one of two most prominent political parties in the United States, the Whig Party rose to power in 1834 in objection to President Andrew Jackson's populist ideals an outright usurpation of congressional powers. After King Andrew I, as the president became known to the Whigs, refused to fund the Second National Bank. While the Jacksonian Democrats attempted to pigeonhole the Whigs as wealthy Northern elites bent on sidestepping the will of the people, Whig party members comprised a coalition of Northern and Southern politicians who railed against Jackson's forced relocation of Native Americans. At the same time, dodging as best they could the escalating issue of slavery within the ever-expanding boundaries of the United States. Some of the party's most influential pre-Civil War leaders included Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, William Seward, John Quincy Adams, and one-term Illinois Congressman Abraham Lincoln. During its 20-year existence, the Whig Party remained staunchly critical of westward expansion under the banner of Manifest Destiny, sending William Henry Harrison to the White House after the presidential election of 1840, who subsequently died of pneumonia just 32 days after taking office. After Whig presidential candidate Henry Clay lost to Democrat James Polk in the presidential election of 1844, Whig candidate and Mexican-American war hero Zachary Taylor again took the White House in the election of 1848, while his death two years later from a gastrointestinal illness did much to derail the forward momentum of the party. When the divisive issue of slavery came to a head in the 1850s, including the wildly unpopular Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, the Whig Party collapsed just as abruptly as its meteoric rise to power. With Northern and Southern legislators hopelessly deadlocked over the issue of slavery, prominent Whigs such as Thaddeus Stevens, William Seward, 
and Abraham Lincoln switched to the newly formed Republican Party, while conservative anti-immigrant nativist proponents within the failing Whig Party followed Millard Fillmore to the Know Nothing Party, leading William Seward to deliver the Whigs' eulogy in 1855, when he stated, let then the Whig Party pass. It committed a grievous fault, and grievously hath it answered it. Let it march out of the field, therefore, with all the honors, making the Whig Party a brief yet bygone era in early American politics. And there you have it, the rise and fall of the Whig Party. Now, the key difference between these two early versions of these parties were their respective positions on slavery and its expansion. Now, since the founding of, its, of the nation, the issue of slavery has been a looming factor in many debates. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was the first major test for the expansion of slavery. It regarded admitting Missouri to the Union as a slave state, but this meant that Congress would be off balance. And see, up until this point, there had been an even number of free and slave states represented in Congress, and the addition of Missouri would have made it unequal. To balance it out, the Compromise admitted Maine as a free state. This issue would continue as new states were added and added, and several more compromises would soon be introduced. Now let's fast forward 30 years, and in 1850, the Compromise of 1850, introduced by Democratic Senator Stephen A. Douglas, admitted California as a free state. On the other hand, it also made the Fugitive Slave Act law. Now this law stated that escaped slaves had to be returned to their owners, even if they had found freedom in other free states. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, also introduced by Senator Douglas, would prove to be a very decisive compromise in the build-up to the Civil War. This act effectively repealed the previously mentioned Missouri Compromise and caused an uprising that would eventually be known as Bleeding Kansas. Anti in Bleeding Kansas, anti-slavery and abolitionists fought in the newly formed state of Kansas. Senator Douglas intended for this to be a peaceful resolution, but it ended up being a crucial prelude to the Civil War and the founding of the Confederate States of America. The, elec the election of 1860 effectively marked the beginning of the Civil War. In this election, Democrats split by the North and the South, slavery supporters and anti-slavery. So, Northern Democrats nominated Senator Stephen Douglas, and Southern pro-slavery Democrats nominated John C. Breckinridge. The Republican Party, still united at this time, nominated Abraham Lincoln, and he easily won due to the Democratic split. In response to his election, South Carolina officially became the first state to leave the Union at the end of 1860 on December 31st. Now, after four years, four brutal long years of fighting, Republicans dominated politics for the next 20 years after the war. And di directly following the war, three constitutional amendments, amendments were passed. The 13th abolished slavery completely, the 14th granted former slaves citizenship, and the 15th gave them the right to vote. After these three key victories after the Civil War, some wealthy Republicans on their high horses believed they had done enough to help the African American community. And under President Ulysses S. Grant, Reconstruction continued and continued, and at the end of his presidency, the Compromise of 1877 effectively ended Reconstruction by removing all U.S. troops from the South and this would begin, would begin what would be eventually known as the Jim Crow era. Now, following Reconstruction, Republicans continued to dominate the, the American political scene. This new era after Reconstruction is typically defined by the infamous election of 1896. This was the beginning of three consecutive Republican presidents, beginning with William McKinley, second Theodore Roosevelt, and third, William Howard Taft. This trio of Republicans was very strong while they were in power, but ended after Taft's controversial term. He was defeated for his re-election by Democrat Woodrow Wilson. He won in, eight, in 1912 and served two terms, serving all throughout World War I. Now, after Woodrow Wilson, there was an election in 1920. 
now. Republicans regained control of the White House with Warren G. Harding. Harding, unfortunately, did not serve a full term and eventually died in office in 1923. But after his death, many, 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 many scandals were revealed. Most notably, the Teapot Dome scandal. Upon Harding's death, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, took office and served until the election of 1928, in which Herbert Hoover was elected president. All three of these men took a very oh, hands-off approach to business and their economic policies. That's why we refer to the 20s as the Roaring Twenties, because most people were relaxed, focused on leisure, and they also, unfortunately, used a lot of credit. Now, this laid-back, relaxed way of thought resulted in the stock market crash of 1929, also known as Black Tuesday. Here's a quick video on the Teapot Dome scandal, by the way. It's still there, far from the bright lights of the city in central Wyoming. It's the Teapot Dome, the Naval Petroleum Reserve. Oil set aside to guarantee that American warships would have enough fuel to propel them across the oceans in time of war. Its biggest impact, however, would be a scandal. Teapot Dome came to symbolize America's greatest period of corruption and transformation, the Roaring Twenties. The image of 19th century America was the pioneer family, the poor rural black the farmer, the cowboy, and the genteel urban dweller. 20 years into the 20th century, these images vanished, replaced by the car, the industrial worker, the flapper, the speakeasy, the black jazz musician, and the gangster. The old culture emphasized production, the new emphasized consumption. The old extolled character, the new, led by the motion picture industry, created a culture of personality. Science replaced religion as a guide to truth. Leisure and pleasure became more valued than hard work and self-denial. The new mass culture, intolerant of the great plurality that marked 19th century America, gave rise to a resurgent Ku Klux Klan. The KKK moved out of the South, targeting blacks, immigrants, Catholics, and Jews. In the 20s, the Republican slogan, a return to normalcy, replaced Roosevelt's and Wilson's idealism. The Republican administrations of Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover took a hands-off approach with regard to business. Coolidge said, the business of America is business. The Roaring Twenties became the decade of greed. Corruption filtered down into business, sports, the law, and the social fabric of the nation. The presidency was not exempt. Harding's administration became mired in corruption almost from the beginning. The most spectacular, the Teapot Dome scandal, came to light in 1923. In 1921, Secretary of the Interior Albert Fall leased the government oil reserves at Elk Hill, California, to a private oil company headed by Edward L. Duhaney and the Teapot Dome reserves to Harry F. Sinclair. Two years later, Senate investigations disclosed that Doheny and Sinclair bribed Fall with hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash, bonds, and even a herd of cattle. Fall would become the first cabinet member to go to jail. On August 2nd, 1923, the good-natured Harding beset by the problems of corruption became the sixth president to die in office. The presidential scandal typified by the Teapot Dome would repeat itself. Will be sworn in as president. Watergate in 1974. Iran Contra in 1987. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And the Monica Lewinsky affair in 1998. Now. Following the stock market crash of 1929, also known as Black Tuesday, this began the Great Depression. 
Now, the Great Depression marks a time when, in my opinion, we see the most significant shift in political viewpoints and political parties of the time. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Democrat, was elected in 1932 in a landslide victory against, Her uh, against Herbert Hoover. Now, when Roosevelt first took power, he introduced a new way of thinking in America, and he thoughtfully titled this The New Deal. This New Deal brought in many fresh ideas on how America should be governed. This included the quote-unquote alphabet soup programs like the TVA, also known as Tennessee Valley Authority, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the WPA, the Workers' Program of America. But FDR also introduced Social Security and helped abolish prohibition that was previously dominating the 1920s. FDR was elected president for, four, for an unprecedented four terms. He is the only president to ever serve more than two terms. The time period of the 30s and the Great Depression shows the most significant switch in ideologies between the two parties and sets a new standard for presidents and politics as a whole. Now, in the middle of FDR's four terms, World War II began, and following World War II in 1945, FDR's New Deal policies continued to flourish under Harry Truman, his former vice president. Truman also made important efforts to deseg desegregate the military. Harry Truman served two, two full terms, and then in 1952, D Dwight D. Eisenhower, a Republican, was elected. Even Eisenhower, being a Republican, still continued FDR's New Deal ideas and policies because he realized that many Americans could not live without these important public works projects, Social Security, and all these liberal social ideas. One of the um, big new, uh, new Deal ideas that he continued to push for was the expansion of the interstate highway system. Many themes from the Great Depression and the New Deal era continued to ring years after it occurred, and they still ring true today. Also throughout Dwight Eisenhower's term, the civil rights issue grew and expanded very, very rapidly. Now, seen as the first major piece of momentum by many, the decision of the liberal-leaning Warren Court on Brown v. Board of Education officially desegregated public schools, declaring desegregation of schools unconstitutional. The Warren Court, named for Chief Justice Earl Warren, would go on to make many, many, many landmark rulings, including Loving v. Virginia, declaring interracial marriage constitutional, and Miranda v. Arizona in 1956, giving people their Miranda rights. Now, following Brown, a series of historical events took place over the rest of the 1950s. The murder of Emmett Till in Mississippi struck the hearts of many, and it was a very brutal murder. No one ever did time for the killing of the 14-year-old black boy from Chicago. But his murder and the trial and acquittal of his killers sent a powerful message. If change was going to come, people would have to put themselves on the line. Contributions to civil rights groups soared. And 100 days after the death of Emmett Till, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white person, and the Montgomery bus boycott began. When people saw what had happened to my son, men stood up who had never stood up before. People became vocal who had never vocalized before. Emmett's death was the opening of the civil rights movement. He was the sacrificial lamb of the movement. Now, like I stated in the video, shortly after Emmett Till was murdered, Rosa Parks, a maid, refused to give up her seat on a bus, and thus began the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted well over a year. This civil rights movement continued to grow and push well up to, into the 1960 presidential election. Democratic nominee John F. Kennedy 
had a very, very close relationship with Martin Luther King Jr. and supported the civil rights movement. This helped him win the votes of many, many African Americans across the country. JFK would go on to win the 1960 election and served almost three years until November 1963. While in a parade in Dallas, Texas, JFK was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald. His vice president, Lyndon Johnson, quickly assumed office and began to push for swift civil rights legislation that JFK had previously advocated for. During President Johnson's time in office, Congress passed many landmark legislation, passed a lot of landmark legislation, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Civil Rights Act of 1968. During this time, many Southern Democrats began to switch parties and register as Republicans due to the quote-unquote liberal policies the Democratic Party was advocating. Heading into the 1968 election, the issue of civil rights was no longer in the spotlight, and instead it was on the growing conflict in Vietnam and President Johnson's handling of it. Johnson chose not to run for re-election in 1968, and thus the Democrats nominated his vice president, Hubert Humphreys. The Democrats nominated former vice president, Richard Nixon, who was vice president under Eisenhower. Nixon sailed into victory, and his first term was dominated by foreign affairs regarding China, the war in Vietnam, Latin America, and the Soviet Union. Now, the 1972 midterms marked a very significant political realignment when the former deep blue Democratic South switched almost completely to a deep red region. This realignment is still rings true today. Following those 1972 midterms, the Watergate scandal dominated the remainder of Nixon's term. Watergate refers to the Watergate office building in Washington, D.C., where the Democratic Party had its headquarters during the previous midterms. Now, the Nixon administration attempted to cover up a break-in at the building in the summer of 19, 1972. Nixon's involvement was not immediately known to the general public, but it eventually revealed itself and he also resigned, becoming the first and only president so far to do so. His vice president, Gerald Ford, assumed office and was quickly beaten two years later by Jimmy Carter, a Democrat. Carter was seen historically as a weak president, but he is also known for his humanitarian efforts and his climate policy. During his time in the White House, he installed solar panels on the roof and declared that the energy crisis was quote-unquote moral equivalent of war. However, in the last few months of the 1980 election, Carter's administration and Carter himself were very overwhelmed by the Iran hostage crisis, and that helped Ronald Reagan sail into a very easy landslide victory. Ronald Reagan defined the 80s with his charm and policies. His ideas and opinions have deeply influenced the current direction of the Republican Party. He made many important judicial appointments, including Chief Justice William Rehnquist, Anthony Kennedy, Antonin Scalia, and the first female justice on the Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. These appointees significantly altered the decisions of the court for many years and ultimately made the court much more conservative. Reagan's economic policies appealed to a majority of Americans at the time and this policy eventually became known as Reaganomics. Do two W-2s make a W-4? Are you kidding? Hi, I'm... Reaganomics refers to the economic policies of Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States of America. We're going to take a look at the economic policy that still affects your paycheck to this day. When Ronald Reagan was elected to be the 40th president of the United States in 1980, the nation's economy had been in a state of great inflation since 1965. The decade leading up to Reagan's presidency was characterized by something called stagflation, where prices were rising even as unemployment remained high, and economic growth was slow or stalled. 
This not only damaged the U.S. economy, but economies around the world. Reagan's solution was an economic plan that became to be known by his supporters and critics alike as Reaganomics. Reaganomics was heavily based on the trickle-down theory. This argues that if you lower costs for corporations by cutting their taxes, businesses use those savings to invest. The thinking was more money for corporations would mean more jobs and higher wages for workers and thus increased spending. But trickle-down is a controversial idea. Opponents argue that when corporate taxes are cut, domestic social programs suffer. And most likely, only a small handful of rich individuals at the top become even richer. Reaganomics wasn't just about tax cuts. The policy had three other central points. Deregulating businesses, turning government services over to private contractors, and decreasing spending on domestic social programs, including food stamps, social security, and disability insurance. During his presidency, Reagan signed two tax bills into law, one in 1981 and the other in 1986. As a combined result of the 1981 and 1986 bills, the top income tax rate was slashed from 70 to 28% the lowest income tax rates for the rich since the 1920s. Reagan's policies were highly debated, and economists still argue about the pros and cons of Reaganomics in terms of both immediate and lasting effects. Proponents argue that by 1983, the nation's economy had started to recover from stagflation. This led to a period of economic prosperity that continued through the rest of Reagan's presidency though another recession soon followed after he left office. But critics argue that based on a normal economic cycle, the economy would have recovered from the recession on its own without Reaganomics. Critics also point out that Reaganomics led to larger, not smaller, budget deficits and a larger national debt. Many people say Reagan giving corporate tax cuts while cutting funding for domestic social programs was a policy that favored the rich and led to increased wealth inequality. While Republicans tend to reference Reaganomics as exemplary policies, Democrats almost always bring it up as an example of corporate greed that hurts the middle and working classes. Either way, it remains a defining part of Ronald Reagan's presidency and legacy. Now, following Reagan's two terms in office, his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, ran for re-election in or ran for election in 1988. Bush mainly won because of the Reagan's Reagan administration past success. Bush's term would be haunted by many different things, including the Gulf War, controversial judicial appointments, and the infamous quote, "Read my lips, no new taxes." Bush would run for re-election in 1992 and be beaten by Democrat Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's term in the White House is defined by many females. There were historic elections of women in Congress throughout the midterms. He had a very influential first lady, Hillary Clinton, and one of the most famous scandals of the century, Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky was an intern in Clinton's White House during his second term. Clinton and Lewinsky developed an affair, and this dominated the last two years of Clinton's term, resulting in one of four impeachments in American history. When questioned under oath on whether or not he had a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, Clinton famously stated, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Clinton would later confess to lying under oath, and he would eventually be impeached by the House, but acquitted by the Senate. The election of 2000 would prove to be one of the most contested and historically significant elections ever. It pinned Clinton's Vice President Al Gore against Governor of Texas and George Herbert Walker Bush's son, George W. Bush. This election was the closest in history and would eventually be decided by a Supreme Court decision declaring Bush the winner. However, Shortly into his first term, not even a year, Bush would be hit by the largest catastrophe in American history. 9-11 changed America forever. 
It impacted foreign policy, civil rights, economics, and domestic policy. On, on the day of September 11th, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell a record-setting 7.1%. Now, regarding domestic policy and America's opinion of different types of people, the opinions of people of Muslim faiths were severe, severely altered following the attack. This is partly due to Bush declaring the war on terror. Now, the remainder of Bush's term after 9-11 would be dominated by controversial decisions and major economic failures. The No Child Left Behind Act significantly impacted education, and it still has important relevance to this day. The 2008 financial crisis brought on by the housing market crash affected the U.S. as hard as the Great Depression did. However, following a significant and brutal presidency, America would soon find hope in an emerging candidate in the 2008 presidential election, Barack Obama. Democratic Senator Obama of Illinois was the first African American major party nominee. His running mate was Joe Biden, another longtime senator. The Republicans also put forth a very historical nomination. Governor of Sarah Palin, Governor Sarah Palin of Alaska for John McCain's vice presidential pick. Ultimately, Barack Obama would win election. Soon after the election of Obama, he began pushing for government sponsored medical insurance through the Affordable Care Act. This act was helped through Congress under powerful speaker Nancy Pelosi, the first female to hold that position. Through the passage of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare was effectively put into place and is still a very hot topic of discussion over a decade later. Now, while Obamacare has some great pros, it also greatly influenced the deepening divide between the parties. Early in Obama's term, he also successfully orchestrated the mission that would end the life of Osama bin Laden, the chief organizer behind 9-11. One thing that specifically haunted Obama's time in office was the prevalence of many mass shootings across the country. Sandy Hook Elementary School was perhaps one of the most heartbreaking. The shooter claimed the lives of 27 people that day. The majority of those people being children under the age of 10. This shooting and so many others continue to haunt our nation well into today. Another topic of hot debate that covered the last year of the Obama presidency was the ruling on Obergefell v. Hodges that effectively legalized gay marriage. This was a controversial and historic ruling that affected the lives of millions of Americans. But, the one thing that would effectively alter, and in some people's opinions, ruin the country after this, is Donald Trump. The Republican nominee in the 2016 election faced the first female major party candidate, Hillary Clinton. Now this election had so many interesting twists, turns, and scandals. Trump, being the businessman and TV star he is, loved the stardom of running for president gave him. Many allegations of sexual assault, tax fraud, and racism plagued the Trump can campaign and still continue to do so. Now, on the other hand, with Clinton, her emails, her private emails, were seen as a very, a very hot topic and gave a lot of people immediate concern. This ultimately made her lose the election. Trump? was inaugurated on January 20th, 2017, and almost immediately the administration began a controversial term. In his first days in office, Trump reversed many Obama-era policies and instated a travel ban on many majority Muslim countries in the Middle East. This was and is still seen as a very racist move, but this was just the beginning of Trump's racist viewpoints while in office. In August of 2017, a rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, consisting of many neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other protesters occurred, and there was ample bloodshed. 
this was a very nasty rally. And in response to it, Trump stated there were, quote-unquote, good people on both sides, effectively sympathizing with the, white with the white supremacists because he knew that their vote was very valuable. Throughout Trump's term, he also nominated very controversial justices to the Supreme Court, including Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Each of these nominations were very di divisive and were approved on party line votes. He effectively changed the makeup of the court for years to come, making it drastically more conservative. Later in his presidency in 2019, Trump faced his first impeachment trial over a phone call he had with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. According to the manuscripts, Trump withheld aid to, to Ukraine in order to push for an investigation into his next political opponent's son, Hunter Biden. Joe Biden's son had previously gotten a cushy job at a gas company in Ukraine, and many in our country saw this as corrupt, fraudulent, and evasive. Trump wanted it to be investigated and would hold Ukraine in his hands until it was. This triggered the House to invoke the 25th Amendment, and Trump was ultimate, ultimately impeached by the House, but, just like Clinton, was later acquitted by the Senate. Trump's final year in office was, without a doubt, the most infamous time period in American history. In early 2020, a virus from China began circulating the globe. Now, this topic could have its own 45-minute presentation with opposing viewpoints, opinions, and debate, but to keep it simple, we will just lay the basic facts. COVID-19 is a deadly disease, it has impacted our world forever, and it significantly defined 2020. Trump's response to COVID is seen by many as disastrous. He significantly downplayed the severity of the virus and just basically tried to block it out. Also happening at the same time as COVID, Black Lives Matter rose to prominence following the brutal killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others by police. These protests dominated the summer, and the image of Donald Trump holding up a Bible in front of a church shows how he handled them. Trump ordered many of his advisors, military officials, and cabinet members to walk through the streets of Washington in order to capture the perfect image. Police cleared the way for Trump and his group, brutally shoving and injuring many protesters. This is very ironic and directly shows what the entire movement is about. Very conveniently, 2020 was also an election year. Democrats nominated Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who eventually would win this election. Following the Biden-Harris victory, Trump began rapidly denying the results. And over the course from, Jan from November up until Biden's inauguration, tensions continued to grow with Trump's anger, and this would eventually result in a deadly insurrection on January 6, 2021, the day Congress was set to certify the electoral votes. January 6 will forever be a stain on our country, and it led to the only president ever being impeached twice. Because of Trump's anger and his involvement in the insurrection, Trump was impeached again by the House and again acquitted by the Senate. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were inaugurated on January 20th, 2021, and this brings us to the present. So, how did this happen? How did Republicans evolve from social justice warriors to big business election deniers? How did Democrats evolve from racist slaveholders to civil rights advocates. In my view, there are a few presidents who have significantly altered the trajectory of our politics. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, Ronald Reagan, and Donald Trump. Each of these men have redefined what their party stands for. FDR pushed for social reforms like Social Security and Public's work, Public Works projects that are still in effect today. Johnson helped pass significant civil rights legis legislation and expanded on FDR's New Deal ideas. Reagan helped push the conservative idea of trickle-down economics and appointed very, very important and consequential justices. And Trump 
he redefined the entire Republican Party in just a short four or five years. Today, we are seeing a significant test heading into the 2024 presidential election. Will Republicans renominate a felon who caused an insurrection? Or will they nominate a book banning, Disney hating governor from Florida? Will Democrats hold out with an almost 90 year old Joe Biden? Or will they choose a new fresh face as the front runner? How these choices are made will severely impact the trajectory of our political parties just as the past has shown.